I want to welcome everybody who is uh, watching us uh, today to our panel, um, introduce our panel, which is increasing content accessibility for multilingual communities, challenges, processes, and needs. Uh, I am excited to introduce our panelists today. We have three uh, language access professionals in the public sector. What we will be discussing today is some of the similarities and differences between public sector and private sector and some of the unique challenges that governments face uh, when it comes to translating uh, for their multilingual communities. So I will let uh, Suzanne, Peggy, and Santiago introduce themselves. Suzanne, do you want to go first? Sure. Thanks. So I am Suzanne Wiggins, and I am a senior information technology specialist for Montgomery County, Maryland. And in that role, I have I work on websites for various agencies and work units within the county. And relevant to our discussion today, I've been managing our COVID website for um, almost the duration of this time. And I have done quite a lot of work there with multilingual content. Perfect, and Santiago? Hi, thank you uh, for having, uh, inviting me and having us here for this panel. Uh, my name is Santiago Torres, and I use he, him pronouns, and I manage the language services unit here at the New York City Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs. Uh, so we, uh, we render services to Moya in about 20 different mayor offices at City Hall, uh, and just a breadth of content, digital and print. Um, so our, our our, our target audience is uh, the two million, yeah, yeah lim limited English speaking, uh, um, limited English proficiency New Yorkers. So that's about the fifth. If it was a city, about the fifth largest city in the United States, and so there are roughly about six hundred languages spoken in New York. That's if you couple smaller languages that fall into other uh, families of languages. So we try to cover as much as possible. So during the time that I've been here, we've expanded from about 18 to 65 languages. So, uh, and that's across materials. And our, our website is uh, localized in the 10 local authority languages, which we'll get to. Perfect, and Santiago, for those of us who are not native New Yorkers, Moya is, uh, is what organization? So Moya is um, Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs. Perfect. And Peggy, if you want to introduce yourself. Yeah, hello, everybody. Um, thank you for having me. My name is Peggy Liao. I am with the City of Seattle Office of Immigrant and Refugee Affairs, and I'm the Language Access Program and Policy Specialist. Um, we are not as, as big as New York City, um, but in the school system, we have about 150 languages. Uh, they're spoken in Seattle, and um, about 25% of our city residents there uh, speak languages other than English at home. And um, we uh, really, because of COVID, um, a lot of departments and, and really city governments and, and also county, we work with public health a lot, um, realize that translation is a challenging area and then that we really need to be able to have more control over how fast and then and the translation quality um, that we can get so um we recently introduced uh, a translation management system well we are using smartcat to um help assign translation project um from city departments and then uh, be able to work with local translation uh, vendors and then tra individual translators uh, more efficiently. And uh, we, I'm sure we will talk a lot more about that later. Perfect, thanks Peggy. Uh, and welcome uh, again, everybody. I'm Clark Hayes, account executive uh, at SmartCat. Uh, before we get started, so government, uh, one thing I wanna preface, government organizations have similarities and differences from private sector, but they're unique in that they use taxpayer dollars to serve their constituents. So everybody runs into the same three challenges, turnaround time, quality, cost. 
governments are, are unique in that they have to be very resourceful about how they use their money and how they approach uh, those turnaround time uh, and quality issues. So those are the three main topics that we'll discuss. And hopefully Suzanne, Santiago, and Peggy will give us some great insight uh, into what governments do to manage that. Uh, the first one is turnaround time. And since COVID, uh, governments have had to respond very quickly to public health information, have had to get content out to the communities uh, and update that content uh, in real time. So one of the first topics I'd like to discuss is how we handle uh, fast release changing content uh, across all the languages that we work in. Uh, so the question is, is simple. It's just what, when it comes to turnaround time, what obstacles, challenges do you face uh, in your individual roles and how do you approach them? What kind of solutions have you come up to deal with them? Does anybody want to go first, Peggy, Santiago, or Susan? Uh, I'm happy to take that one. It has been my bread and butter <laughs> for some time. A very familiar problem, unfortunately, or challenge. You know, let's um, turn it a little bit positive. So when updating COVID content, sometimes that has changed uh, multiple times in a day even. And so we present some of our content in um, seven languages, in English and then six other languages. And so my challenge has been submitting that for translation and having the English content, which has been, like that's my, my primary of, of what I compare the translations to, um, having that change before I even get the translation back. So that then um, becomes difficult because not only are we juggling the versions, but they're out of sync before they even get, get back to me. And that's not because the translation team is, um, working too slowly, it's more a reflection of how quickly the material, the information is, is getting updated. And so one of my workarounds has been, or how I deal with that, and I'm sure that we will come back to this topic multiple times during our time together today, is that when I write the English content or edit the English content, I, I really do it with an eye on plain language in the hopes that if that language is as clear and as plain as possible, that it will be easier for somebody who is less proficient in English to understand in English. And if they end up using a machine translation tool, that when they put that language in there, the English language, that it will come back as a more successful translation. Perfect. And I think Peggy, you had uh, some comments along those lines as well. Maybe if you want to. Yeah. As well. um, I definitely agree with Suzanne. I think plain language is a uh, really important component and really everyone should write in simple and plain language. And another area is uh, we are able to work. Um, so uh, when pandemic when, when everything happened, 2020 March, um, I personally um, was um, just like borrow to King County Public Health to just work with them directly. So we have that uh, direct uh, firsthand communication materials uh, confirmed by uh, the leadership, uh, we can quickly review what needs to be published the day of and early morning. And uh, my role is really to just take key component, really just need to let people know what to do. Um, no, but like we, we tend to write in a very long blog post, say uh, what happened yesterday, what happened last week. So today we have to do X, Y, and Z. Uh, we're able to just take what, need to, what you need to do today and then translate that component really quickly. Um, and, and so that's one area. And another area that I mentioned earlier that um, we are really thinking about what other ways that can help us quickly turn around our translation project. So um, instead of working with translation vendors, uh, they're bigger and then need more time, one or two weeks. Um, we basically just contact people who are core certified, people who know our professional translators and then invite them to become 
uh, to be a group of COVID responding translators. And then we just work with them directly. And um, back at that time, we still communicate via email and everything was um, done that way. Uh, but we were also able to translate into seven, 10 languages um, within 24 hours. So that was the two approaches um, that we took um, here in Seattle and King County. Okay, nice. And Suzanne, sorry, um, just to get a sense of scale, how many languages do you work in uh, for those projects and how many individual translators are you coordinating with? So we have um, seven languages, so English and six others. And during most of the COVID time, um, the county pulled together a team of volunteers, so inter people who had internal capacity to um, work in multiple languages. And so um, there was a group of people working on each language. Uh, some languages had more depth than others. Um, Spanish, it was easier to find people for than something like uh, the Amharic team was the smallest team. Um, so it really depended on uh, people's availability at, on that day of, of who was able to do what. And so um, that was another challenge or is another challenge is that translations come back at different speeds. And so my instruction to the team is always don't hold a translation, give it to me the moment that you have it and I will be delighted to receive it and to uh, apply it into the, the page that it needs to go on. So that we're, you know, because the reason that we're doing this is to provide equitable access to the information. And so I don't want to hold it just because we don't have all seven languages. Um, what I do is I, you know, if I, I feel like that information needs to go in all the languages at the same time, I'll put the plain language. So we'll have a mixed language page, which is uh, not an ideal. And then as soon as the translation comes in, then I'll replace the, the English part so that the page as quickly as possible can return in, back into the language that it's supposed to be in. Perfect. And Santiago, on your end, when it comes to turnaround time, what, what kind of challenges do you come across and, and how do you approach them? Yeah. Um, so just to take a little step back to kind of, kind of paint a picture of how things were. And when I came in, really, there was everything was done ad hoc. There was just like a shared drive. And they said, Santiago, here you go. And like some uh, contracts that were uh, drafted 10 years ago, over 10 years ago in 2010. Uh, with some language that, I mean, regarding turnaround times, I mean, some, the language there said, you know, vendor, contractor must deliver things in CD-ROM by this date. You know, it was like that. So uh, very anachronistic. So one of the first things we did is like, we centralized the services back then, you know, audited vendor performances, uh, tried to move away from, you know, doing this work with, uh, just with bilingual staffers, because a lot of them have a lot on their plate already. And so, and we just went on this long education training process. By the time the pandemic hit, we had already been successful at securing some good contracts, particularly with one vendor for translation, a New York based vendor. And I'm, I remember clearly the, the day before we went to lockdown, having a meeting with them. And, you know, they understand the work. They work with a lot of cultural institutions here in New York and across the United States. They work with other city agencies as well. They're small LSP. And so they, once we were all affected by this, so they were, you know, as well, they weren't having teams across the, the, the world and so forth, even this global pandemic. But I remember one of the meetings, one of the representatives said, you know, we'll do anything because this is our duty as New Yorkers. So what we did is, uh, again, just for the beginning of the pandemic, they assembled a team of, it was 25 languages that were the first response, the rapid response languages we did at the beginning of the pandemic. So the first four months of the pandemic. And those we, you know, social media uh, notices, uh, infographics and so forth that we were able to deliver between three to 24 hours, depending per language. So they had a translation and a translator and editor per language for the 25 languages, uh, about three or four account reps and, and us as well, moving the information along. So there was really about nearly 60 people on call during the uh, seven days a week during the first four months of the pandemic. So that was, uh, uh, basically it, it was an issue of vendor management and, uh, and ensuring that everybody was on board. The other is that by that point we had already built out a Spanish unit. So we already had some TMs 
uh, in Spanish. We are you know, we use uh, trials and multi-term. So we have some glossaries and terms, but then again, terminology was evolving as well. So we had to adapt and do some research and so forth. So in Spanish, we were able to deliver immediately any any types of uh, changes and versions or edits or updates, we were able to do those instantly. But also one thing that happened with timing is that we had been piloting working on the website localization project with Marlin for several years, and it was really slow. But by the time the pandemic hit, and again, this is complete timing, we, we were done. So when we were able to present this to our commissioner and really executive teams and so forth, because they're like, how are we going to do this digital content? How are we going to move this dynamic content fast? We're like, well, we actually have this thing. We're just waiting to show it to you. Uh, and then we immediately created a COVID resource site that was updating constantly. And at the beginning, uh, during those first four months, we about 25% of web traffic was coming from the multilingual sites. And so it's, uh, it became a very useful tool. We were putting, you know, it, the link into infographics. It was shared with our communities through, you know, WhatsApp and WeChat and so forth. So uh, again, it was just, a, it, it coincided uh, a lot of this rapid response and improving turnaround times with work that had been done uh, for the last two years. So that's, we were perhaps one of the few teams that was ready <laughs> for something completely unexpected. But it's still an ongoing process, naturally. There's always a challenge. Got it. And I think that's similar. So the, the website content is, is interesting. And Suzanne has similar experiences there. I guess on your end, Santiago, is that also going in 24 languages? And just to get a sense of scale as well, what's the how many times a day or week are you updating that content? And what's the average kind of size of a project uh, going in those languages? Yeah, so at the beginning, uh, it, it really has changed over time. So the we translate into 10 languages, the 10 local authority languages. Uh, I mean, they include everything from Arabic, Bengali, Korean, Spanish, Urdu. Uh, so that you see the breadth of the type of scripts and the challenges on, uh, on right to left languages and so forth. And the Smartly, Smartly platform, you know, helped take care of a lot of things that our IT team uh, struggled with, you know, some of the localization, backend, internalization uh, work that needed to be done. So that was handled. At the beginning, we were doing um, we were doing large update. I mean, if not completely re launching new sites, you know, that were anywhere between ten to twenty thousand words, and we can, and, you know, those will be done in a, say maybe a week, week and a half or so. For dynamic content, you know, we can turn it around in, this, in twenty-four hours. So if, some of them, if it's just a, a short. Uh, um, like just short messaging, just in a few hours. Uh, now, um, it, the, the website is not, uh, because we're also going through administration change. So the programs and all those initiatives are changing. So right now those updates are only like once a week. And a lot of it is just, again, circumstantial. Uh, but now that we have, you know, we have a new commissioner, new executive team members, new mayor and so forth, as programs and messaging and something that's there because there always something happens here in New York, it will likely be that usage will increase once again. But the infrastructure is there already. So pretty much ready for whatever comes. Okay, nice. And, and Suzanne, on your end, how often were you updating that content on the website? And what did that process kind of look like for you? So I was updating a lot and I'm, I'm still updating. Thankfully, the pace has lessened a little bit. Um, but really just yesterday, I, I made a change to one of our translated pages. And so now I need to see how I'm going to handle that moving um, forward because our process has changed a little bit. So the English content, sometimes I was changing multiple times a day. Um, in the height of the pandemic, what I found myself doing was at the end of the day, like, you know, late at night, I would think about what has changed today and what is the stable version and then prepare a file to send to the translation team that they would then work on, not when I sent it to them, but it would be ready for them the next morning to, for them to work on and um, get back to me as soon as they were able to do that. Um, one difference that I wanted to elevate that I feel is um, different between the web content and maybe the more traditional way of thinking about translations is that in my world, sometimes it's just a sentence here or there that changes. And so I'm not, like the whole text is rarely ever ready <laughs> at once. You know, initially the whole text is ready and then it gets prepared and sent over and I get the whole thing back and, and we put it. 
after that, it's more like, oh, this element change. So sentence here, sentence there. Um, that is actually for me more difficult because then when I get the translation back, when I get the product back, I need to figure out where it goes on the page. So we now have a translation management tool that allows me to send HTML and they work on it and it comes back as HTML. So that is, I was so overjoyed when that capability came into play um, because otherwise I would have to cut and paste. And uh, that actually is physically difficult work because of the very close concentration. It's hard on the eyes, it's hard on the, you know, all the small muscles that have to do with the mousing. So I just wanna mention that as sort of this unexpected uh, side effect of the work, you know, not only does the translation need to be carefully done and, and quality controlled and all of that, but then placing placing it into a web page, um, if it's a manual process, which for us it is, then there's that aspect as well. And super attention to detail because you have to figure out exactly where it goes. And for me, a language like French or Spanish is easier to place and figure out where it goes than something like Amharic, which to me is, um, uh, it, it's a new language to me and one that, you know, I am much less familiar with the characters. And so that then requires super concentration in order to get it right, because of course I do want to put it into the right place. Otherwise, what's the point in, in doing that? So it, it, to recap, sometimes it's very small phrases or sentences that need to be um, replaced in order to make the update. And so I feel like that's, um, you know, that's a different way of thinking about translation. So not only is the, the, is it often time sensitive, it's these snippets that need to be translated. And, you know, from a cost perspective, then how do you handle the money? Um, thankfully, I didn't need to think about the money in our process. Um, and if you do, you know, how do you do that? We did have some text that we would have needed to have translated externally. And so then that, uh, you know, I, I think twice about what is that going to be like? And uh, who all needs to approve it before it goes and darn it, it might change tomorrow. So um, yeah, it's been an interesting time. We've learned quite a lot. Yeah, that, that's uh, it's very interesting and a good, uh, good segue to the second um, topic, which is budget and costing. And it sounds like projects can vary from a couple of words in a sentence to 10,000 words uh, for the entire website. On each of your in each of your organizations, you probably handle resources, vendors, technologies differently. What kind of challenges do you run into from a budgeting perspective in getting the resources and tools that you need? And what are some of the approaches that you've taken to to handle that? Um, maybe Peggy, we can we can start with you on that one. Yeah, well, the challenge is always that people always say, like, I don't have money for translation. Um, and uh, so we are, we don't have a centralized language access budget that other departments can pull from. Um, so uh, a really big component of my job is also to really persuade people and then encourage people to explore language access services and then include that in their campaign. Um, so be able to support them with data and then and, and, um, give them enough time to budget for language access and then really be able to leverage resources, existing resources and really put translation or interpretation out there um, is a long journey. And, uh, and we started to um, encourage people to make language access plans uh, in 2017 and 18. And then last year we did a, an update um, to align our language access planning process with our budgeting cycle. Um, so the budgeting cycle coming up for 2023 and four will be happening in June this year. Um, and the reason to update the plan last year is for uh, to reserve that long time for our language access program managers to be able to talk to their finance team and really to think about how much they should really budget for it. And, um, and then they can work with me to plan for 
items and uh, really navigate the whole process and resources. So um, it is, you know, kind of a game of both changing minds and hearts and then also really uh, to come back that reality that people are fighting for resources and and also because of um, uh, the pandemic, like a lot of cities, counties, states, like in general, like people don't have money and uh, we need to find places to cut budget. Um, so under that big climate, how we can keep moving forward and then talking about budget, ensuring that we do have resources down in the road for um, us to use. It's, it's a big challenge, but we are doing that. And then another way it is to really think about other ways to, uh, if we can reduce duplication, translation, and really be able to think about translation and interpretation from a holistic perspective and, and point of view, um, um, it's also very important and something that we are doing. Yeah. In in landscape wise, is it a cent? You said it's not a centralized budget. Not is that a right? So you're you're advising other agencies, departments, on how to structure their language access programs. Is that that accurate? Um, it depends. <laughs> so it is not centralized to a way that each department also don't have a centralized language access budget. So ideally, if each department, let's say human services department, they don't rely on individual program managers to say how much money I need for translation department on the department level, people can say, okay, program managers, we have um, like $20,000 this year that you can pull from, then that would be easier for program managers. Um, and then the other way to centralize it, it can be like, okay, the Office of Immigrant and Refugee Affairs, you have $2 million each year and 30 departments can draw from your budget. That is another way to centralize it. Um, but we still want to keep the balance of if people put in the dollar amount into their budget sheet, that is ownership. And they are given the responsibility to use the money wisely um, and we also want them to be able to feel like that is their program they're responsible to providing language service to people who they're engaging with um, so a lot of ways that we can talk about centralization um, um, but that's a thinking behind like how to balance the responsibility and ownership mm -hmm. Perfect. And Santiago, is it a, what does the landscape look like for, for your organization? Any particular challenges that you run into from a, a budgeting procurement perspective? Yeah, this is a, it's very interesting because, you know, when I got into this field originally as a translator, it's because I like works. And then increasingly it has become, from an operational side, such a big part of the work we do that uh, crunching numbers and as Peggy said, creating dashboards, data sets, metrics, visualizations, and all that's basically what I do about half of the week these days, especially now <laughs> that budget season started for us. And we have a new, so everything, this is very timely. So I'm, I'm going to give you a very raw response of how the landscape looks like, because again, new administration, new types of folks, new types of people that we have to engage from er, from from an early stage. So that's the first step that, that we've been doing, because there's been consistent changes to procurement rules procurement processes, uh, new folks who are trying to get to understand what these uh, processes and rules are, uh, budgets are decreasing. And then the other is, of course, the challenge of trying to explain to folks, you know, the, the technicalities of our field, like what a fuzzy match is, what a CAT tool is, why do we need all this stuff? Uh, I had to just recently talk to a contracting officer trying to explain minimum fees and what that means, you know? And so, uh, so it's, a, it's you know basically it's a, it's just a form of constant engagement. But the way that we've been approaching this, though, is not only trying to get the key stakeholders involved from an early uh, early process, but using a lot of the uh, legislative infrastructure that was built as well 
and also like for folks to to notice these are essential services, particularly with the pandemic of how much information we were able to produce. And, you know, we have data for that and the turnaround times and so forth. And also how much, what the cost was and how we can become more cost effective in certain ways. Uh, you know, we're trying to push for more in-house resources because the ROI in our field is more significant than if we outsource it constantly, you know? And so, so we frame it as that as an ROI, but also a question of advancing equity and language access and to comply with the law. If we do not get these funds approved, if there's a gap in service, there's a problem, it's a problem of compliance. And so the last thing the city wants is language access complaints to be filed because there's a system for that through, through one of the city agencies where people file language access complaints. The other is, and again, uh, as, as Peggy was saying, it's like how to present this. So of course, with a very accessible data, uh, and the metrics and to show the magnitude and the impact of the work. Uh, and, and one thing particularly is that, again, because just of, because we inherited a lot of these RFPs from, from over a decade ago, that, were, uh, that, you know, that we provide clear justifications and clear scopes of work. Uh, and, and very important, the clear uh, uh, recs that are needed. So we don't get just a mega vendor who's going to bid the lowest price that we know it's not really realistic. It's not market rate and not paying their linguist market rate. And that's going to, a lot of things that are tied into all this conversation about quality and turnaround times and so forth. They are, uh, you know, they're affected. So uh, we have a baseline budget, but not everybody else does. So that's the Department of Education. Uh, you know, they have a massive, like, uh, translation interpretation unit, like 50 linguists on staff, project man, they're, they're really like an LSP there. They're probably one of the largest LSPs here in New York City, <laughs> actually. And the Department of Health has a small language unit, language access unit and services unit. NYCHA, the New York City Housing Authority, has one too, but that's about it in us, our little shop here, which also kind of functions like an LSP. But while the local law has all these language access um, uh, rules that you have to translate into those languages that telephonic interpretation needs to be available. The language in the law doesn't factor budgets. It doesn't say that, okay, we every agency, pretty much like Peggy was saying, not every agency has this like by law, this amount of money. So it's really how, and part of our planning and really of just like the evangelizing of language access and language justice is to ensure that people uh, budget this from the beginning. So while we have a small budget to sources, a lot of agencies do not. So for us, as part of the larger, something that some of my colleagues here do on the policy side, of language access trainings, language access uh, presentations, convening of language access coordinators to see how they can advocate for these funds, how they can, uh, what other source of funding avenues out there, uh, how to create a proper RFP and solicitation requests, what's the difference between in-house and in-house unit and outsourcing and so forth, and just trying to see different costs and, and procurement uh, rules. And, you know, for us, it's an ongoing education process as well. We're constantly engaging with the mayor's office uh, for contracts, uh, with the MWB office, uh, you know, with di different contracting uh, agencies, just to ensure that we are on top of it, but it's challenging. You know, it's uh, what mm, we know today might be different by the end of the week. <laughs> so especially now with new administration and so forth. Okay, um, perfect. And I know, Suzanne, you said that you don't uh, deal with budgeting on your end. Uh, is that because they're internal resources? Or what, what do you typically do when you have to structure your, your translation programs? And you're muted. Um, yeah, so I'm on the IT side of the house. And um, so I don't have a, like, <laughs> my work doesn't have a budget for that. So I'm relying on the, like, the customer departments. Um, to either have the money or right now we are in the beginnings, middle, whatever, of setting up a, an in-house language unit and working out the specifics of how that's going to work. So, um, yeah, so I don't come, like my work doesn't come with its own translation budget. Um, I'm relying on those other sources of money to provide the funding. The one thing that I will add to the budgeting discussion is that um, at least from my side, that the translations are not one and then you can check off and then they're done. It's an ongoing thing. So even if there's the upfront cost, you know, like let's say for the COVID work that I've been doing, that it was translated and, you know, that was paid for. Well, now the information changed. <laughs> and in fact, it's going to keep changing and it, it changes quite a lot. So 
you know, that comes back to how do we budget for, how do we pay for these snippets of translation that are ongoing? Um, that I will also add are, they're not necessarily everyday language. So now you're also working in specialized language and is there an additional cost for doing that as opposed to more day-to-day -day wording that might be used? And, you know, in English even, we've had new words enter our vocabulary through this COVID time, right? Who knew what a contact-free pickup was um, at the beginning of this? Who knew about PCR tests and, you know, like all the, the ins and outs of all of this stuff? And what is the difference between a, an initial dose of a vaccine versus um, a booster shot versus an additional dose for somebody who is immunocompromised and you know what is immunocompromised and, and what do you understand when you hear those phrases so i feel like that is an additional um, wrinkle that we deal with on the government side because it's not just that you're you need a translation into this language it's that you need a translation and it's medical terms or you need a translation and it's legal terms or you need a translation and now we're talking about building a road and so, um, you know, if the same person ha has facility or the team has facility in all those subject areas, that's fantastic. And if they don't, how are we going to handle that? Perfect. And that's another, another good segue into the next topic of quality. And the one thing I heard on even on the budgeting side is it's never really about the cost and trend value of it's more about the value of translation. So you can do it internally, you can do it with external vendors, you can do it uh, with individual translators, but it's how do you educate people about the best practices and then implement that to get the best value and ultimately it's about uh, quality. So on the, uh, on the quality side, what are some of the things that you keep in mind, kind of what would be some of the best practices and advice you would give somebody approaching translation for the first time to make sure that you have consistency and quality when dealing with all these different content types and Peggy and Santiago, in your case, different agencies, different uh, divisions who do things independently. Uh, Peggy, maybe we can start again with you. Yeah, um, well, I, I think about that quality and also cultural relevancy a lot uh, when it comes to translation for our city and just in general, um, Washington State, Pacific Northwest. Um, and so that's the big decision that we made to go with uh, working with local translators uh, instead of just giving out a big contract to a vendor and then say, find your translators. Um, and so we now work with about 65 people on the team and they are individual um, contractors that uh, we work with. Um, and also with the translation management system, it is easier for us to assign project to many people and then uh, invoice accordingly to each department uh, who, was, who requested project. So basically that flow is 30 departments can, anyone with the department can submit their project online and portal. And then we then assign the project after reviewing the English content for simplicity and readability, assign that to translators and reviewer for each language. Um, and working with local translators really re preserve the cultural relevancy and then really just the understanding of what is going on with, this, with the city, who the mayor is, um, how we're talking about public safety and, and really like what, what's going on, pandemic, wear a mask or not. Um, and if someone who don't live here, um, it is more likely to get the information wrong if they're just translating from their, uh, the original country of a, a language. And so um, that is one thing that we decided to work um, in this workflow and um, also because of uh, we are getting requests. So we, uh, as the language access team can provide our recommendation in terms of 
the English content. Um, so we always review for um, if, if the content is ready for translation. And we can communicate with the requester and then say, hey, we actually recommend instead of saying um, open house for something, you just say you have a public hearing or you have a public meeting. Um, so you don't translate it um, in a confusing way. Um, yeah, so those are the elements that we put in to ensure quality. Um, and I'm sure we'll get into like translation memory and terminology, but I'll let Suzanne and San Diego talk about that. And Suzanne, on your end, what kind of challenges do you face? Uh, what advice would you give to manage quality? Yeah, from what I've seen, the, like, developing a glossary is super helpful. <laughs> um, also so that from translation job to translation job, you have consistency and the person doesn't have to retranslate it or go through um, a lot of effort to try to remember what they did the last time. Or if it's different translators doing the work that they, they come up with a consistent product. Um, Peggy, while I was listening to you, I was reminded that um, so my work is on the web, right? So I try to write for the web in English and um, and I try to display the even the translated content in the same way. So for example, I don't want, a, like ideally the translator gives me back the linked language. Um, so I don't need to go back and figure out like where exactly do I need to place the link? And this is one of the, like, the huge bonuses for me of the translation management software that is able to handle HTML. So in English, you wouldn't use click here as a link. And so that's what, ideally, I don't want to get that back in the other language. Or, you know, I, I'm typically quite intentional in the English that I give to the translators to be linked. And, um, you know, this is where my not having facility in all the languages might be a, a minus. I don't know. Um, you know, like, so I know what would be good practice to link in in English and in the languages that I am familiar in. And so I'm hoping that that's also good practice in the language that is being presented on the page. So for example, you know, to make it a meaningful link. So if a link were to stand on its own, again, thinking about equity, if somebody is coming with accessible technology in order to access the information, you know, you don't want it to say, learn more, learn more, learn more, no matter what the language is in or click here, you want that to, to have meaning and you want things to be bulleted and you want things to have headings and so i i feel like the the more like we there used to be a series of radio ads here in this area that said an educated um consumer is your best customer and so i feel like that with the translators as well like the more that we have that shared background in what is writing for the web, what is plain language when it comes to the medium that we're working in, that we then all can lift up our work together and have that be the most successful presentation of the information that we're trying to get out there. Because in the end, people who are coming to our, our websites, whether it's on a phone, whether it's on some other device, um, especially in this time, you have limited capacity to understand regardless of the language, right? Because there's so much going on. There's so much, so many pressures that we have on our thinking. So we want that to be as easy as, as easy to consume as it possibly can be, regardless of the language. And so, um, yeah, so knowing about, you know, even that writing for the web is a thing, I, I think is useful. Perfect. Uh, and Santiago, on your end, when it comes to quality, what, what do you think about? What kind of advice would you give? Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, all, all translations, we all, we all receive feedback you know, for anybody. As we know, one of the challenges here is that a lot of bilingual folks, while really uh, well-intentioned, you know, they provide, uh, uh, you know, our feedback uh, without really following some like linguistic uh, quality metrics, you know, omissions, mistranslations, you know, uh, and so forth. And it's just, uh, you know, we recently received one where it was just words were just circled in a scanned translation that was done. And, and we're like, what is this? Like, no, you figure it out. We just don't like it, you know? <laughs> and so uh, one of uh, that ad hoc nature, while we've been working to, uh, to centralize, is still there. 
because uh, once we release a translation, it's, you know, people have it and there's going to be feedback. And again, there's so many languages too, so that, uh, and, and regional differences. So for instance, uh, in Yiddish, for example, just Yiddish here in New York, what's spoken in central Brooklyn is very different than where I live in northern Brooklyn. So there's going to be difference there. Uh, with Bangla, there's uh, in parts of Brooklyn, it's from a particular part of Bangladesh then, in Jackson Heights, Queens. So, and we receive that feedback and, and all those, and again, just Susan mentioned in all these languages, aside from Spanish and some French, I really have no, it's hard for me to vet that. So what we did and what we advise uh, agencies and other uh, peers and colleagues, um, once when possible to try to centralize and streamline the feedback loop and to see what any patterns and the types of feedback. And one of them is also to provide uh, if folks want to be, I mean, not linguists, you know, just in the case of bilingual stuff, which is always the case that somebody's going to give you feedback, at least provide some simple metrics as to the different categories and say, like, as we call it, like penalties for, you know, a severity of, of, of mistranslations and omissions and so forth. It's a grammar issue or syntax or style and so forth. And then we can break that into categories and we can assess just the gravity of, of the issue of quality. But Prior to that, that's, but before that, one thing that we do to start, and you know, we talked about glossaries, and so for Spanish, we have a lot of control. We're really the gatekeepers for the content here for the mayor's office, at least, uh, because we already have term bases. Uh, we have a ton of terms that we've been accumulating throughout the years. Of course, as, as Suzanne mentioned, like the terminology keeps on changing. Um, I didn't have to put into that term base how to do a, a nasal swab for a home test, you know? And then we decided like, all right, yeah, we do this, uh, my colleague who does, takes the first crack at the translation, she's Peruvian, I'm Ecuadorian. So we're like, how do you say this in Peru? I say it like this in Ecuador, but we live in New York. All right, let's see if we can find a thing. So a great resource has been at least to do some agreements on the translations community ethnic media. There's a lot of it here in New York. Some of it's very good. And so uh, we can reach out to some folks to help provide some input, but, um, and again, just something when working with the vendors, at least when, as I mentioned earlier, what we did during this auditing phase is that, okay, we were able to change vendors and create this new solicitation request and put quality and, you know, even liquidated damages languages here for any type of cases, but also to give them, you know, more parameters here. So we did create some style guides, including uh, some uh, glossaries, at least with the most common terms that we, like the, the name of our agency, for instance, the name of other, a few other agencies, very difficult to coordinate. Uh, we, we try to do it through convenings and so forth. Uh, but again, it's very difficult uh, in government. But then, um, uh, so at least we're like, okay, if we can get in the local uh, 30 languages, so the 10 languages, uh, mandated by the city, like, let's get at least the agency names, let's get something that our programs are sharing. At that time, particularly when I started was uh, like TPS, Temporary Protected Status, uh, you know, like uh, uh, DACA and all these programs on the immigration level, but like now increasingly it's been on the health, uh, healthcare and so forth. So we're trying to update those glossaries. Uh, our, again, our Spanish TMs organically have been able to give us consistency and accuracy. Uh, but we do pass those along to the vendors to like to ensure you follow these uh, glossaries, the style guides. Uh, again, with the, our, our vendor, the good one, <laughs> they actually help us create some of these glossaries and sometimes give them, they distribute and create them pro bono. Uh, but I guess they're a little bit of a different type of vendor. Uh, and another thing that we've done is uh, uh, just we've rewarded the RFP language so that not only us here, Moya, we can get the best vendors, but really also the agencies, because again, one thing that is happens here in, in New York, I'm sure maybe it's the same with we here with the, our colleagues in the in the panel, is that a lot of folks who are language access coordinators for other agencies, they don't come from the industry. So we need to give them share that information along on how do you evaluate an RFP, how do you evaluate quality? What does that mean? You know, how do you do uh, terminology management? What are CAT tools? You know? So that's like another part of our portfolio of trying to inform uh, our different stakeholders. But I mean, it's even with the most sophisticated tools that we have, say like our the most streamlined and efficient work stream that we have is our website. There's always still, you know, uh, quality issues people come back to us. And that is, you know, a vetted process with linguists who have been working, the same linguists work on the same projects with the, across materials. So it's consistent, you know, we try to integrate the TMs with our printed work and so forth. 
but it still happens, you know? So it, it comes with the territory. Perfect, thanks, thanks Santiago. Um, we have about 10 minutes left. So the last, uh, last question that I'd like to cover is just open to you guys and what one piece of advice would you give somebody who's approaching this for the first time, whether they're in the public sector or private sector, what's the like one piece of advice you'd give someone looking at translation for the first time? Santiago, if you want to start. Yeah, I mean, so what we do, and we actually, again, we're doing this again, because we have to provide a series of trainings to new folks in our, uh, we just joined this administration. It's like, we frame this as a question of, of equity and language justice, and of course, compliance. But the uh, first piece of advice is we tell them to think multilingual. Like, please don't think multilingual from the start, to be considerate and respectful of our uh, limited English proficiency New Yorkers communities, uh, to plan, uh, that understand the language access and localization is a collaborative effort, it's a creative effort, and that in some cases requires time and it's a, it requires subject matter experts, linguists, proofreaders, uh, typesetters, so forth. Uh, and so to plan properly, to budget accordingly, and, uh, and to coordinate. And, and naturally that we're here always for assistance with that. But the main, the main message is think multilingual from the start. Think about our, our constituents. Perfect. Good advice. And, and Peggy, on your end. Yeah. Um, I So uh, I, a lot of cities and counties will, will come to me and say, hey, uh, can you offer a piece of advice? How do I start? Um, I always say just hire someone internally whose job will be thinking about language access, language justice, translation interpretation day and night. Um, it is really helpful to have a designated person, team to keep pushing for cultural change and then keep including tools and resources into the workflow. Um, and, and then we can expand that to like really encouraging people to think uh, in the multilingual way. Um, yeah, so that is, and, and that does not only apply in the government um, setting. I think a lot of companies and organizations can think about if they do work with people who don't speak English or um, speak prefer languages other than English, um, it is really helpful to have um, someone who's on your team can advocate for users of different languages. Yeah. Perfect, and Suzanne, what, what one piece of advice might you give? This week, my advice having just uh, at the being at the beginning of a, a, a new web project is to really bake the this multilingual um, view in from the very beginning. So when you think about a new website, think about so what languages is this going to be in? You know, don't assume it's going to be in any one language, but just ask that open-ended question: What languages is this going to be in? Who's going to be responsible for those? Who's managing the translation process? Because that is a process in itself. You know, the building a new website is a process, and so this subprocess is is the multilingual aspect of it. So, just like when you're doing good user experience or making a good user interface, you want that to be thought about from the very beginning and not be this afterthought at the end. Keep. Uh, lifting up this need for language access and how you're going to handle it and incorporate it at every step so that it's not a surprise at the end or it's not this, oh my goodness, this thing that we need to do at the end, but you know, how is this going to be handled? How is it going to be displayed? How is it going to be presented? How are you managing the translations? So that um, it's just a natural part of how you do this work. Perfect, oh, that, that's I, all. And Go Another ahead, um, sentiment that I've observed uh, from people who don't speak other languages but English is that they 
uh, like people will feel like, oh my God, I don't know about translation and interpretation and I don't want to do it wrong. Therefore, I don't do it. Um, and I think like people make mistakes and people make language access complaints anyway sometimes. And so uh, it is better to have a open-minded and then, and then just just put your resources out, but also have that, build up that expectation that you will do it wrong, but you will correct it. And then um, that building trust uh, and relationship with community members is way more important than uh, being afraid of doing something wrong. Perfect. That's all, all really good advice. I want to uh, thank Peggy, uh, Suzanne, Santiago for, for joining us and for everybody who, who watched the video today. Um, we're going to post it on LinkedIn. We'll have the ability to put comments in uh, the comment field, and then we'll get those to Peggy, Santiago, and Suzanne to answer uh, if anybody has any, any comments. Um, but just want to thank everybody again. Uh, really informative and valuable discussion. I hope everybody is well and has a great rest of the week. So thank you. Mm -hmm.